Coach? There we are. All right, all right. Well, go ahead, Coach, with your time. Excellent. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. And obviously, I had a chance to listen to Justin there. Uh, as he said, a, a fellow Queens alum. And uh, it's always great to see uh, players from, from your university who had great careers. And, and Justin certainly did that at multiple positions. So, um, you know, obviously, I had a chance to listen in. And uh, one thing I can build upon is on the RPO side of things, I can say that uh, uh, here in the OUA, as well as the AUS, uh, to build on what he was saying about in the, in, uh, in, in Quebec, uh, in terms of getting called for, for people downfield blocking, it just doesn't happen at our level. So uh, pretty fortunate uh, for that when we run RPOs. But today we're going to be talking about um, smash concept and also data-driven football. So super excited to talk about that today. Uh, I'm just sharing my screen here for you. Hopefully you can see it. Uh, as Justin had at the, at the end of his presentation, I have a contact card here at the very beginning. Uh, I'll leave it up again at the very end. Um, Hopefully you guys have some questions about some of the things that we discussed. It is going to be a little bit different, I think, than, than uh, uh, presentations maybe in the past. There's a lot of data we're going to go over at the very beginning. Um, I won't bring it back up. So if you're, you are taking any notes, want to questions about the data, there may be at the end. Happy to answer those for you as well. Uh, but we're going to talk about Smash Concept, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, for us, uh, we're a, we take a minimalist approach to offense. So we're not running a ton of concepts. In fact, when we go into any game plan, and, and to give you a little bit of background where I've been in the last, I guess, three years, in 2017, I was at uh, St. Mary's University uh, as the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach, and it was one of the, uh, I would say, biggest turnarounds that year in terms of the offensive production in the country. We went from 23rd in, in the country in offense to 7th in the country in offense. Um, and then at Toronto last year, again, took over a team that was 25th in the country on offense. Uh, and we went to sixth in the country in total offense. So some pretty, some pretty big improvements. And in both places, we actually averaged 100 yards per game more than the previous year with, with almost the exact same talent. It wasn't, uh, I didn't have an opportunity at either of those two schools to get there early enough to be a part of the recruiting classes. Um, so it wasn't like we uh, overhauled the, the talent and athletic ability. What we did was we took a data-driven approach to offense. So one of the things that, you know, you could talk about and, and we've, we've heard different people talk about today is match defense and how we attack match defense or, you know, uh, what I really liked hearing Justin say in his presentation is that the defense is taking a numerical approach to uh, blocking the offense from throwing the football, basically. So we accept that and we won't, we won't attack uh, match defense at all. In fact, we're going to attack the box when, when they give us numbers to the box, uh, regardless of down and distance. So, and that doesn't mean that we're necessarily running the football because I think um, for those that, that are aware um, in the two places that I've been, uh, we've been extremely pass happy. So much so that I would say we border on air raid uh, if you had to look at what we're doing. And that's not necessarily who we want to be. It's who we've had to be based on personnel, based on where we were at and based on potentially what the score could be in the game with how our defense was, was producing. For instance, last year at Toronto, our defense was ranked 26 out of 27 teams. So we recognized that we were going to have to score a significant amount of points to give ourselves a chance to, to win games. So one of the things that's really important to us, and we'll talk about why, is that we always attack. Uh, when we're attacking the box with a plus one advantage, and we can use RPOs to help facilitate that. But when we're straight up throwing the football, we're looking for an even numbers approach. So if they have three, we have three. So you don't have a free hanging over or any apex backer, you know, significantly outside of the box that is trying to add in right on the snap. Um, we do use a lot of RPOs, but there are obviously times when we're just going to straight drop back pass. And when we do that, we're looking for even numbers approach. So this is the smash concept that we're going to talk about today. And you notice that we did draw it up to the boundary. Uh, the formations that we predominantly use uh, at the places that we've stopped and, and obviously now at, at York as well, will be 23, so two to the field, three to the boundary, 31, three to the field, one to the boundary, 33, so an empty formation with three to the field and three to the boundary. And any combination of that, so whether it's 23 double tight, um, you know, we don't use closed formations, so you'll never see us with a tight end of the boundary with no receiver outside of that. Um, we just don't like that in that situation, the corner gets to play low and almost be a box player and they can have a half high and two for one, and you know they basically get an extra box defender on us. So we stay away from closed formations. So if you're going to see some film of us today, 
predominantly you'll see us in 23, 31, and, and some 33 as well. The concept we're talking about today is just generic smash. Uh, we're going to run uh, an X or a wide out for uh, the, for the three receiver side, whether he is to the field or boundary. Again, if we could run smash to the field out of 33. Um, he's going to run a six yard hitch and he's going to drive back down his stem for one yard. We're not going to try and work further back downhill than that. If the corner drives down hard off that, uh, obviously we're going to be throwing up over the top. Uh, our number two receiver is also going to run a six yard hitch coming back down his stem. Um, he's also going to have active eyes to the will linebacker if it's 33 or the Sam linebacker or 23, or if he's to the field side and it's 33, he'll have active eyes to the Sam backer. And what he's looking for is if that Sam backer is getting out underneath him, he'll wrap aggressively in behind him. Okay. So he's going to do the quarterback's work for him on that. Uh, if the quarterback comes there and we'll talk about the quarterback's read in a moment, um, he'll accept that the, our number two receiver is making the decision for him. I think the one way we're a little bit different than other teams that I've seen running smash is what we do with our number three receiver when we run the corner out. Uh, first, we're obviously going to outside radical release because we don't want to be working back across the rain or back across the uh, defender when we're trying to get back to the corner. So we're going to outside radical, then we're going to restack him. Okay. And we're not going to break to the corner, not at 12 yards, not at 18 yards that I've heard from, from uh, different people across both countries, uh, Canada and the United States. We're going to actually work to the depth of the deep third defender. So for instance, if that corner continues to carry vertical, we'll carry vertical. We're not going to snap to the corner. And the reason for that is, is that if that corner is carrying vertical against us uh, and he sees a snap to the corner, his first reaction is going to look back inside to see if the ball has been put up in the air. And if he sees that the ball has been put out and thrown to the X, the wide out there on the six yard hitch, it allows him to trigger and rally down after at that point. If we continue to carry vertical because the corner continues to carry vertical, we're putting him at a disadvantage because he, he has to make sure that obviously he's collapsing down over the top. And we're, we're ensuring that he can't get his eyes into the backfield and see that the ball's been thrown. So he's not going to be able to help out in terms of, uh, of making a tackle. So that's basically the assignments of uh, each of the uh, receivers on the play. Um, this is the read for the quarterback and how we read it. And I think most people are, are pretty cognizant of the fact that when we're throwing smash, we're reading the, the corner. If he sinks, we're taking the hitch. If he uh, aggressively jumps downhill or tries to, to bait us, uh, we want to go up over the top and, and, and throw that corner out. There's a few different things, though. And I think uh, one of the things we've really tried to do uh, over the last three years is make uh, the quarterback's reads as simplistic as possible and still giving them as much direction as we possibly can to uh, you know, find the open receiver, so to say. So for this case, we read the corner, we throw opposite. In this particular case, things can go wrong from there. And we don't say read the corner to the half or the corner to the free, because we think that that's just too much language and verbiage. And if you, the more plays that you run and the more reads that become, um, I guess, difficult to assess, um, it, again, it just clouds the quarterback's mind. There's a lot going on. Um, and, you know, one of the things, just again, listening to Justin in the last uh, presentation, him talking about it being a lot easier to coach the, co the quarterback to do the things than for him sometimes to execute on the field. So for us, we really want to make sure that we're always giving him his best opportunity to execute on the field. So what we do is we say, if it gets cloudy from, go there. So for instance, if it gets cloudy from the inside, and that would be the weak half here, uh, if you could see my, uh, my mouse here. Uh, right over the number two receiver. If it gets cloudy from there, we'll go inside and replace with a throw to the number two receiver. So if the half, so for instance, let's say they play hold coverage and the corner bails, we want to throw to the X right now, the wide out on a six yard hitch. If that half is aggressively saying, okay, I'm not going to worry about this number two receiver, the W, I'm going to get out underneath that number one, we replace him with active eyes. So cloudy from the inside, go inside immediately. Our W, our number two receiver, he's going to have active eyes on the Will linebacker. So if the Will is presenting the same way as the weak half, who's just flying out to get underneath something, let's say it's second and seven plus, and we're in that situation, he's going to get his active eyes on that Will linebacker, and he'll wrap right in behind his head looking for the ball. Our tailback uh, will be check releasing away from the Will linebacker in this particular case, checking off the Mac. Um, or this, yeah. It, so, so if he if he uh, if he blitzes, obviously he picks him picks him up. But if he falls out, uh, he'll replace him on the check down. So again, if the, if the Mac or the number two backer in the box gets underneath the um, uh, the wrap route, 
our quarterback's eyes would naturally bring him back to the check down or to scramble up through the middle. Same thing vertically. If the corner sits, uh, jumps down hard aggressively on the number one receiver and we go to throw the corner, if it gets aggressively cloudy from the middle of the field, we'll replace him with our J. So on the backside, what we would run was post and go or post and dig, one of the two concepts. And we'll attack the middle of the field with that person. So if that free safety wants to get extremely aggressive and, and come flying over the top of the corner, we'll replace him with the, with the number two receiver strong attacking the middle of the field. This allows us to represent all field zones uh, and allows us to make sure that if somebody wants to do something out of the ordinary to take away a certain route that may not be fundamentally sound, we have something built in already. And our quarterbacks know we're not reading the corner to the free. We're not reading the corner to the half. We're reading the corner and our eyes will take us the rest of the way. So we talk about data-driven football. And because, look, I'm talking about smash concept. This isn't revolutionary. And I'm, I'm quite certain, other than maybe the depth of the route on, on the corner route, everything I just spoke to, or maybe some of the rap principles on our number two receiver, everything I just spoke about, I'm sure everybody is familiar with, right? Uh, how do we run smash? What is, you know, uh, how do, what's, it's a corner read. Where we're a little different is why we run Smash and why we run these concepts and when we run these concepts. So what I've done here on this and speaking about data-driven football is that all decisions that we make are not gut, not, we don't make feeling, uh, gut feeling decisions on play call. Everything that we do is a direct reflection of what we see. So first of all, in order to do this, we cannot huddle. We just don't have the time. We have a 20 second shot clock here in Canada and we just don't have the time uh, to get to the line of scrimmage and do those things that, that would do that. Outside of the red zone, we rarely, rarely um, motion. Uh, not because we don't see value in motion. Um, in the red zone, we obviously do because we know that we're probably gonna get banned and we can create some leverage with that. But between the 30s, I mean, it's, 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 an, it's a coin flip uh, on if we're gonna get man or zone. And we're not really interested in giving up eight seconds for motion to see what happens and then have to reset, recalibrate and run a different play. So you'll see that we don't run very much motion. It's not to say we don't attack the line of scrimmage. Of course we do with, uh, with our waggles. Uh, but we're not going to run any cross-field motion that will change the, the formation. And again, that's a timing issue. And it's also a clarity issue for the quarterback. So one of the, you know, obviously having played quarterback myself, one of the biggest challenges was always when there's motion, yes, I can tell if it's man or zone, but I don't know what man or what zone it's going to be necessarily. And also, you know, some of our decision making that's going to be coming off of that for our receivers, we may have to have different people that they block, it becomes a little bit more challenging. And we don't know, if, let's say, you know, let's say we're not willing to attack a, a three on four situation, right? It's difficult to win. The, the more people are defending you in a field zone, the more difficult it is to have success. It's not to say that, look, if we're throwing a three receiver route combo against a four defender uh, defensive combination, that we can't be successful. Of course we can. Of course we can stick an outrageous throw or a good throw. You know, maybe somebody makes somebody miss in a tight window uh, after the catch and, and explodes for a bunch of yards. What this chart right here that's on your screen right now does though, is it explains the value of always attacking with a numerical advantage. So again, recognizing that at St. Mary's, again, we went to one of the least productive offenses in the country. And at Toronto, we went to one of the least productive offenses of the country with almost no turnover in talent. Okay, so in these situations, the first uh, side of this, I just got to move our, my image out of the way here because I'm looking at myself in the red section. Um, if you look at the red section, it says L. Um, what that represents is that these are all the plays where teams attack without a competitive, a, a numerical advantage, okay? I've blacked out all the teams uh, other than St. Mary's and Toronto. They're not here to represent themselves today that are on this chart. And these are teams from across the conference and also across the country. Um, so this, they're not here to represent themselves. I'm not going to put out who is who. But what I will say is it's a very consistent application of what's going on. So when teams attack without a numerical advantage, they average 4.69 yards per play. The quarterback holds the ball for 2.45 seconds. The quarterback completes 52.3% of his passes um, and an interception rate of 2.67, okay? This number here I'll get to in a minute, what that means. Um, it's a little bit more complicated because it's also a combination of all the teams. So the second uh, section here, which is green, is um, how, 
how productive teams are when they attack with a numerical advantage. Now, some of the sample sizes are smaller because as you can see and you'll notice, teams aren't attacking with a competitive advantage that much. And I'll show why that's important as we go further. But you can see these are the yards per play. So from 4.69 yards per play when teams don't have a numerical advantage, now we move to 10.13 when they do. So they've doubled their production just by attacking with the numerical advantage, irrespective of what play is being run, okay? Irrespective of what type of offense they run, whether it's power football, whether it's spread option, whether it's RPO based, whether it's air raid, they are running at, at double the production and plus, you know, almost 110% um, of, of uh, so 210% of where they were uh, when they weren't attacking with a competitive advantage. In addition to that, there's some more benefits. The quarterback, instead of holding the ball for 2.45 seconds, is only holding the ball for 2.04 seconds. So what that means is that we're now at a, a drastically reduced uh, rate of strip sack fumbles. Like the reason why they're not they're holding the ball less is there's no second window throws in this. So when you have second window throws, the quarterback's going to hold the ball, in this case, 0.4 seconds longer, which gives the defensive ends or defensive tackles an opportunity to beat their men or any games a chance to get home. It's got 0.4 seconds longer to do that. Okay, the quarterback's completion percentage jumps from 52.3% to 73%. So we're looking at a 21% increase in completion percentage. Who wouldn't want to be able to just do that with just not even changing the plays that they run, just maximizing their formation? And then here's the big one. Interception rate drops from 2.67% down to 0.85%. Okay, so now we got to look at what do these numbers mean? How did they, what did they do for us? And how were we able to get the, the success that we were able to have? Because again, we were adding 100 yards per game over eight games each season uh, in two different places that I would say nobody really expected anything from, okay? So the first thing that you have to notice is how often teams attack with a competitive advantage. So these are all the teams across the, the, the conference and the country that we've, we've put into the system. And you can see, you know, here's the team that's attacking with a competitive advantage or a numerical advantage 14% of the time, 18% of the time, 28% of the time, 27, so on and so forth. Like, I mean, you guys can read the numbers. They're not, they're not tremendous. Um, and then you can look at us at same areas. We were attacking with a numerical advantage 79.89% of the time and Toronto a little less. And we were at 67. Well, obviously not where we want to be. We're aiming for 85%. And the thing, I, I guess I would say, the reason why we fell off at Toronto a little bit is as, as good as we were offensively, there were some challenges and we were for playing from behind. As I told you, we, our defense was ranked 26 in the country out of 27 teams. So we were often in chase in the fourth quarter. And as much as we want to stick to numerical advantages at all times, when you're down 10 points with a minute and a half left, uh, attacking the box and getting eight yards isn't doing much for us. So the fourth quarter, and I would say really significantly the last two minutes of five games, drove our numbers down from the low 80% into uh, the, the high 60s, you know, 67%. So how does this impact overall? Well, a couple things. I think this shows, first of all, we were deficient athletically. So for instance, when we were attacking with a competitive advantage, we were actually averaging far less than all of the teams in the conference who were also attacking with a competitive, when, when, they, had, when they had a competitive advantage. So for instance, you can see this team was really through the roof. So they were a really athletic team. And I know this because I know who that team is. And you can see that there's some other teams that are also uh, substantially more athletic, two, three, and even four yards more, six yards more over here, more athletic than us when attacking with a, a, a numerical advantage. To demonstrate this further, you can see when we were attacking without a numerical advantage on those rare plays, uh, for us, the sample size is quite small. It doesn't happen very often, but um, in this situation, you can see that uh, we're still substantially below all of our competitors in conference. Again, there's a few teams that at St. Mary's, we were a little bit better than. But at Toronto, you can see there is nobody who attacked without a numerical advantage and got as little statistical uh, um, done as, uh, as we did. But when you factor in everything and you realize that we're always attacking with a numerical advantage, so more of our plays fall into this category than they do this category, you realize that in the overall grand average, which you can see on the far right, suddenly the yards per play total start to become a lot more balanced 
and we're at the top of the list. So although we're not more athletic than our opponents, and we're certainly not um, getting more yards per play when we have a numerical advantage, or we're not even getting more yards per play when we don't have a numerical advantage, because we're always attacking with a numerical advantage, we actually are on this list second um, in terms of overall yards per play when you factor everything out. And that's such a powerful thing. I'm now in a very fortunate situation where I've had the opportunity to go to York University, and I'm absolutely blessed with athletic ability on the back end. And I think this could be an opportunity to have the biggest growth in terms of one year taking over and, and creating a new opportunity for our team uh, to, to be successful offensively. And I think that uh, it's really exciting for me because I look at what we were able to do without that speed and back end athleticism and now know that we have it. And I can tell you that one of these teams on here is York. And I can tell you that um, the numbers specifically should say that we should be uh, amongst these three teams that now I've been to the most successful turnaround yet. So super excited to hopefully finally get together with our team. Uh, obviously we've had a chance to do zoom meetings and, and um, you know, talk to our quarterbacks and talk about reads and making sure we're attacking with numerical advantage, but there's no, you know, there's no replacement for being on the field and we're super excited for that opportunity as it comes. So the last kind of data driven information that I'll show is again, um, yards per play. Again, this breaks it down. So the last one just said, how successful are you when you attack with a numerical advantage? This one shows again, same teams. This one shows how, it, how successful you are when you attack with a numerical advantage by field zone. So this is boundary, this is box, and this is field. So the wide side of the field, and this would be the boundary is the short side of the field. The box is attacking uh, either run game, crossers, or, or traditional screen or shovel screen, however you want to do it. Um, and you can see, again, the numbers are, are telling a very, very large story. So I'm not going to go through each team, and I'm not even going to go through us, but what I will show you is that when teams um, attack without a competitive advantage and they're attacking the boundary, they're averaging 5.3 yards per play. When they attack the boundary with a numerical advantage, they're, attack they're getting 11.1 .1 yards per play. Same thing with the box. When they attack the box without a numerical advantage, they're averaging 3.6 yards per play. And when they attack the box with a competitive advantage, over, over doubling it, almost a first down on every run play. Base. And again, this isn't surprising. It's just taking the discipline to make sure when you get that box um, that, that's reduced, not throwing into match coverage because how many incompletions? Let's say our completion percentage is 40% when we're throwing into match coverage. So that means 60% uh, of the time, we're getting zero yards on those plays. So we're punting, right? And if we, if we had a second and seven, you know, we're averaging a first down pickup when we're running against a deficient box. Whereas we already know that if a team's averaging 40 or even 50% completion percentage against match coverage, they're off the field 50% of the time. Even if we get six yards against that deficient box, at least we're giving our head coach a chance to make a decision and decide, hey, do I want to punt here? Do I want to take the points on a field goal? Or are we willing to risk it and go for it on a third and one situation? And then when we look at the field, you can see obviously the field is going to be the greatest opportunity, but it also has the greatest risk because the ball is in the air longer. So teams who attack the, the field without a competitive advantage or a numerical advantage, they're averaging 5.6 yards per play, and they average 12.7 yards per play when they do have a numerical advantage. For anybody who's wondering, have I run these numbers outside of U Sports? Yes, I have. Um, the numbers are strikingly similar for the CFL, and although very, very similar for the NCAA, I would say, uh, I would caution that they get far more too, highs, uh, too high coverages and they have four downs. So instead of the numbers for the team is being consistently in the 15 to 25% ratio, they're, they're uh, attacking without a competitive advantage. They would be in the 20 to 35%. Still not where you'd wanna be, but a little bit better than what we see in Canada based on the amount of downs they get and the amount of too high um, um, defenders they get. And again, that just gives them the ability to run the ball an extra down and be safe and in, in most cases, they're attacking a weak box uh, when they're doing that. So it gives them that advantage. So today I have some film to share with you. I'll be pretty detailed with it. And I am going to leave a little bit of time at the end for, for some questions. Um, if you have any, hopefully there, there are. I mean, um, obviously there's, there's been a lot of data to go over. And I'm happy to revisit those slides at that point if you, if you do have any questions. But we're in the presentation. The data-driven uh, slides won't appear again.
But today we're talking about Smash. So let's, let's kind of bring everything back together now. So we know that we're looking for a three-on-three -three advantage, or three-on-three, -three, which we would consider an advantage. And we also recognize that, um, you know, obviously from there, we want to run the Smash concept. Okay. So the first thing is, and you can see in this particular case, to the boundary, we get our natural three-on-three. -three. We've got a free safety who's beyond our threshold, and I'm not going to talk about what are some of our rules are when we go, uh, just because there obviously there are some competitive intelligence stuff. Uh, in terms of what our specific rules are. Uh, but if you connect with me offline and I realize that we're not, you know, obviously going to be playing against each other this season, I'd be happy to share a little bit about what, our, a little bit more about what our rules are uh, when we go and attack field, when we go attack boundary, who we're reading off of pre-snap. But what I can do show at least today is show you what the numbers are and then you can understand why we're attacking them. So today you can see that uh, obviously we have a three on three to the boundary. If I click back here, you can see one, two, three right here. Then we've got box defenders, field defenders right here. So we've got three on two to the field. We've got three on three to the boundary and six on six to the field. So six on six for us is not a win, right? Uh, we, we don't run traditional zone read. Um, again, we're not saying that it's not a good play. We think it's a great play. Uh, we don't run it because we think that it's a little bit more challenging for our quarterbacks to read. And again, this isn't can they not read it, can they read it, can we teach it? Can we not teach it? We feel like we can teach it. We feel like they can run it. We just see that our success rate in terms of how often we're right versus how often we're long is drastically reduced. Um, and, and it's not just us. When I look across the country, and, and again, not just our league, and I look into the NCAA, when, when I team, watch teams running zone read, I think there's a, a lot of blurriness that coaches um, experience when we're explaining, like, when do we pull? When do we give? And then quarterbacks really experience it. And again, getting back to Justin's point of talking about it's, it's a lot easier for coaches sometimes to explain things than quarterbacks to execute it. So again, and, and knowing that, you know, when I, when I was playing, um, zone read was a play that was kind of just coming into existence um, and becoming popularized. And I can tell you that I struggled with it. Um, and, you know, obviously I thought our coach did a great job of teaching it and I worked very hard at it. Um, but there's just so many things like, you know, when, when a player – is really you know athletic and he steps down aggressively and shows you his numbers and has the ability when he sees that the ball is given to tear off and hard heel line down the line of scrimmage and still make a tackle um, what's our answer to that and when we realized we didn't have an answer or a good enough answer i should say uh, we just got away from it so so again so that's why six on six is an advantage um, if we were to rpo though i mean it's not to say that we wouldn't rpo against the six on six box that's a possibility we just know that the, the likelihood of us RP, uh, pulling against a six-man box would be really substantial because there's one defender in here that we just can't block, right? So he's going to be tightening those throwing lanes. So if we were to RPO, we would recognize that in this particular case, um, that, that defender would likely stay in the box, which would force us to pull, and then at least give us or guarantee us, I should say, um, of that three-on-three -three that we're really craving. Now, smash isn't the concept that we would run – uh, with an RPO. And the reason why we wouldn't do that is because we try and make sure that if we are RPOing, the, the decision is very quick for the quarterback to pull and throw, and that there isn't any real second level read. And I think Justin was getting at that, you know, especially in terms of, you know, how, you know, how uh, the receivers are making decisions for the quarterbacks. Quarterbacks are reading one key defender and getting rid of it. We feel the same way about our RPOs. So in this case, when we're running smash, we will not tie it ever with an RPO. Okay, so we'll play it through here. You can see we've got the three-on-three -three matchup to the boundary that we're craving. Okay, and now we're going to play it through a little bit here. And you can see how positive different plays, places. Hopefully the screen is smooth. Um, so you can see we do waggle, obviously, everything that you would expect from a Canadian team. We've, we've attacked the line of scrimmage. So we've got a six-yard hitch coming from our wideout. A six-yard hitch with wrap opportunities coming from our number two. You can see our number three receiver here is working for an outside radical off of their number three defender. And then he's going to look to restack him. As you can see right now, he's outside released him. You can see he's on his outside body here. Okay, and now he's going to restack. Okay, you can see our six-yard hitch here. They're both working too. You can see that since the number three defender is carrying this vertical so far, there won't be any wrap responsibilities here from our number two receiver. So this should just play out normally. Two six-yard hitches with a corner route, okay? 
you can see now our number three receiver has already reached the depth of the deep third defender. Then the deep third defender potentially is locked on with our, our wide out. So as soon as he wins, he can break to the corner right now. And you can see right here, they kind of got lost in coverage and they gave up our number three receiver. And obviously we've got a free throw for a touchdown. And again, I'll just play it back for you. As I talked about on the backside, we attack with, in this case, um, actually this one got mirrored. So this is a potential where, um, again, so we compartmentalize plays. So I know sometimes, uh, and I'll talk just briefly about this because I don't have a lot of time. We compartmentalize plays. So and it's fun because um, from a self-scope perspective, like normally we would want to run posts and either dig or go on the backside. And you can see that we're actually running smash on the backside. And, and the reality is, is that this play probably got changed at the line of scrimmage. The quarterback initially probably had uh, all vert concept on with smash and then saw that he had boundary and wanted to take advantage of being in the red zone and throwing smash against man coverage. We want to take the shortest throw with the least moving parts with all, when at all possible. And I'll say this, we go in this order when we want to attack. As hard as this may be for people to believe because of how, how much we throw, uh, we want to attack the box first, and then we want to attack the boundary, and then we want to attack the field, okay? So we want to go box, boundary, field. Because we know that the, the, the chances of us throwing an incompletion are much higher to the field than they are to the, to the boundary. And obviously, when we're attacking the box, we know we're going to get plus yards if we're in a, in a plus one situation. So again, obviously we get fortunate here and you can see we did restack, their defender fell and, and we get a free touchdown. From the tight perspective, I mean, there's not a ton to show here other than the quarterback is immediately getting his eyes on the corner. Okay, as you can see, we're seeing some pretty, um, you'll see it throughout the course of this, uh, the film that we show, we get some pretty unusual fronts. Again, with how much we were throwing the ball last year, uh, people were you know, playing with stand-up linemen all over the place, uh, attacking from five yards depth, like a prowl front. So again, but you see, it, you know, at its most consistent, there's six men in the box here. It's really just a 4-2, uh, but they've, they've tried to disguise it with some, some prowl or some stand-up defenders. As you can see, we get, we're a, we're a three-step drop team on, on Smash. So we're three, we'll hitch if we have to, we'll kick it out on time if we can. Obviously, we're able to kick this one out on time. So again, right now, we'll do the, the same kind of numbers deal that we just did here uh, from a second ago and, and understand that um, um, what we're looking at. So we can see right now, obviously, whereas the free safety was more positioned in the middle of the field than the last time, he's now positioned to the boundary which allows, even though this will linebacker is in the box against us, it's such a short distance. And so I guess you guys probably noticed that 32 was not a formation that I say that we use. Um, and the reason is, is because we, we don't like that when you're in 32, a team can play cut coverage, okay? Have your half high and still expand your will to get underneath them. And we don't like that because obviously um, they get a quick three on two on us and get to have six men in the box. And even if we RPO them, like it gets minimized. It's not to say that we're not going to complete the, the ball, uh, but it's a lot harder to catch and run after the catch with the will expanding after he's read RPO and starts to follow late and an in-breaking route. So everything that we do is to maximize yards per play. And that's what we focus on. And we recognize the more yards per play that we get, the more first downs we get, the more points we're going to score and the more success that we're going to have. So in this case, we get a true two on two to the field here. Sorry, true three on three to the field. I, and, and as I was saying, sorry, I thought it was 23 again. Uh, we're three on four to the boundary is how we would consider this. And then six on five to the box. So we're definitely outnumbered in the box in this particular case. True three on three to the field, three on four to the boundary. So again, we talked about what our rules are. And this is a really interesting one because we told you that we're running our corner route at the depth of the deep third defender. Okay, so in this particular case, you can see we've run our hitch with an inside uh, release here. We're not wrapping off anybody because there's nobody to wrap off of. So he's just going to settle right here. There's our six yard hitch out here. We're not driving back down our stem for the ball. We're at six. We're basically just working maybe a yard back looking for ball placement right now. Okay. And what you see right now is our, our corner 
who's already at, let's say, six yards to the, the uh, where this receiver is, and then another, let's say, eight. He's already at 14 yards, and he hasn't even collapsed his cushion, so there's no way he'd break. But also, he hasn't got to the depth of the deep third defender. So he's going to continue to carry. And you can see he's still carrying right now at 22 yards. And the beauty of it is, look, the ball is in the air already. In fact, here's where the ball was thrown. The ball has left the quarterback's hand right now. And you can see that the corner is still identifying what our number three defender is, and he's worried about him. So what we're doing is we're creating space for our wideout to catch the ball by continuing to carry vertical by our number three receiver. And you can see the ball is almost three quarters of the way to the receiver before the corner even reacts to it and recognizes that the ball has been thrown. And we still haven't even broken to the corner yet. It's not until right now that we actually break to the corner when we've collapsed the distance of the, uh, uh, of the, of the deep third defender. As you can see, the ball is almost in the wide O's hands. And as he catches it, you can see now we've got optimal space here. So he's got, let's call it eight yards in every direction um, after he catches the ball to get yards after catch. So when we talk about getting more yards after catch uh, because we're attacking with a competitive advantage or a numerical advantage, this is what this provides. If they were plus one, somebody would have been squeezing down potentially on this throw, which would have meant that after the catch, he would have been at two or three yards, right? We still would have probably made the catch potentially. Um, maybe we wouldn't have, but if we had, we would have had a whole lot less room for yards after catch. So again, we set it up and we get four or five yards after the catch. And you can see, look, this was second and very long. And now we've put our coach into a decision here where we could say, okay, we're at the 28 yard going in. We have a chance here on third and one and a half to go for it. We could take the points, right? We were outside of field goal range or we we're right at the, the, the fringe of field goal range here before. But obviously now we've put ourselves into a positive situation. So again, this one's pretty clear to see. You can see here, this is an obvious three on three here. This is an obvious three on four here. They've still got five on five in the box out of 33. So we're gonna attack the boundary again here and we're gonna run smash once again. Like this is just dead to us. We wouldn't even look here. Because again, you can see now how there are multiple players who can play vertical. There are multiple people who can get underneath. Again, if we were to run smash, three could pass and trigger to get to under two. Two could get underneath one and they've got two guys squeezing the corner out, right? So what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we attack with a numerical advantage and that gives us the ability to go weak here. So again, from there, again, it's just smash concept for us. So you can see, look, we're already at the depth of the deep third defender. So once we win leverage on our, our defender, we can break to the corner. So as last time you noticed, we were breaking at like 22, 23 yards. This route should be significantly less. So again, there you can see the outside radical release here. He's gone, he's worked. He's gonna to work to get back on top now and restack him. So you can see he's put himself into a two-way go on this defender. So you can see he's gotten back on top. This defender has to be worried about middle of the field because he knows that the free safety is pushed over. So he has to worry about, hey, is he running a post? Is he running a corner? Is he just running a go? He's got a, basically a two-way go here on him. We've put ourselves into a tremendous uh, situation here to succeed. The ball comes out a little early. That we didn't do a great job in protection, even though we were only blocking five. Um, and the ball comes out early. The quarterback knows he can throw him flat for safety. And you can see now we've broken to the corner and we've put in the defender completely into chase, right? And the quarterback's done a good job of throwing the ball to the sidelines. Yeah, we're not going to get as many yards after the catch, but because we have all that space, because we created that two-way go, we're getting, a, you know, in this particular case, a 23-yard gain or 20-yard 20, 20 gain. And you can see, I'll show you the tight. Obviously, um, you know, we've got five on five in protection here. We just, uh, we just don't do a really great job of it. In fact, I think it's really four that gets home. Yeah, so they come off the edge here and you can see we've got a game on two. So we're in, we're in with a situation where we're three man zone with a two man backside concept basically. So just your traditional half man slide. Um, in this particular case, um, we should have been um, absolutely fanning to this and we popped for some reason, um, you know, which, which you know, it, look, there's some challenges to this. And you can see as he pops, um, you can see he actually trips as he comes out. Okay, and this is why we want to fan in this particular situation. You can see he trips, 
uh, which allows him to go up over the top and, and put a little pressure on the quarterback in his face. But as you can see, uh, we do complete the ball uh, and we get a positive 20-yard uh, gain. Come back, um, I, actually it was the same play. Yeah. Here we are against uh, Waterloo again. So a slightly different look. And I think in this case, actually we bust and we attack a numerical disadvantage, we do. So if I'm being, again, I'll always show you the good with the bad. We actually have a two on two here that we want to attack. And in an ideal world, we should have been RPOing this defender right now. Okay. Uh, but instead, obviously, look, we're human. Uh, we do make mistakes in the line of scrimmage, but again, recognizing that we're attacking at Toronto with close to a 70% uh, success rate when attacking numerical advantage. And at the same areas, we're close to 80. It doesn't mean that things aren't going to go wrong. The reason I put this one in, though, I think is because uh, we're going to show some wrap rules here from our number two, who's going to be trying to position our, our quarterback favorably to the boundary. So you can see here how aggressively the number three defender, the will, gets underneath number two. And he sees him here. So as he gets to his six yards, you can see his eyes are directly on him. He's outside releasing our number three. So our quarterback's still reading corner over here. And you can just see that we're getting squeezed, right? Like you can see they're coming over here. They've outnumbered us. And you can see why, you know, why we have a negative yardage play. I think this is a great example to show why numerical advantage is so important. So we do everything right, okay? Here's our six-yard hitch. Here's our wrap rules. Here we are running our vertical concept, okay? So, and again, you can see here, we're reading the corner. It tells us to throw the corner. This is the boundary half, so we call this cloudy from the bottom, okay? Because it's coming, the, the half normally lines up low. So cloudy from the bottom, we go to the bottom and throw to number two. He's now trying to put us into a positive situation by wrapping. So you can see right now as he wraps, he's coming across, and again, the Mac got really aggressive, or the will, I guess, the Mac got really aggressive, big pardon, and came flying out to get underneath the wrap as well. Had our quarterback seen this and checked down, obviously there's a check down wide open. The reality is that's a tough ask for a quarterback, right? Read the corner, feel cloudiness, see that the, the wrap isn't what you want, and come to the check down. It's really tough, and we're asking him to hold the ball longer. This is the classic second window throw, which is what we're trying to avoid. Whereas if we had just gone to the field in this case, right, and seen that, look, we have that two-on-two, two, and RPO this defender, first of all, we either get a five-man box that we're running through. But if he stays, look, we've got true two-on-two, two, we can throw a hook right behind him, okay? And again, that's where we should have gone on this particular play, inside of the ideology that we use when we attack defenses. But again, you can see this play breaks down because of this. Uh, obviously, you know, we had an opportunity to throw a check down, the quarterback wasn't able to get there. We've got scramble rules on now, and we get a zero yardage play. So this is one of those plays, again, that drives it down the, the average. Could we have hit check down? Yes, we could have. Would we have got five or six yards? Yep. But that also would have driven down our average because we're averaging you know, close to 11 yards when we're attacking field, 12 yards. So again, we should have been RPOing and attacking field. And as you see, this was a five-man box that we would have ended up attacking because the sand would have sank. Um, but again, it's a bust. We do bust from time to time. You won't see it very often. Uh, but what we do, we're, we're the same as everybody else. Uh, it's hard to throw into outnumbered situations. Um, here we are again. Actually, it's the same play again, sort of same problem. Here we are again against Carlton. Again, running smash again. You can see, um, once again, you can see the free now. Adding in to make a two on three over here. There's your true three on three with a six man box. So the box is dead, six on six, two on three, we're dead. Three on three, we're solid right now. Okay, and again, we're just gonna run smash from here. So here we are with the outside release off of the number three defender again. Okay, two six yard hitches. We'll see if we have any wrap rules on as we go. Okay, you can see number three, although he, uh, you know, he's not, I wouldn't call that very good man coverage. He continues to trail though. So whether you want to call that lock and, and some sort of cut coverage in behind it and, and, and three lock. Look, our number three receiver that you see here uh, was second in the country in receiving. Our number one receiver, our boundary receiver, led the, uh, I think he was second in the country. Second, they were second and third respectively. And uh, 
they were, uh, he was first in the country in touchdowns and he was second in the touch, or they were tied for first in the country with touchdowns with eight each. So they had a tremendous amount of success and they started to get things like this where somebody locks on. But all it does is just affect the rules for number two. Because three wasn't aggressively trying, the will wasn't trying to aggressively get underneath number two, there's no wrap going on. He just runs a six yard hitch. Again, our six yard hitch here. You can see we haven't broke to the corner yet here because look, we haven't collapsed the depth of the deep third defender. Also, we haven't collapsed the depth on number two. We're going to continue to carry that vertical. You can see now we finally break to the corner once we've gotten there. But look, the ball's well gone. And it's just now, he's already catching the ball, right? So he's just breaking on his route. The ball's been caught at the sidelines. And the corner is now just in a position where he's starting to rally. So once again, look, we've got eight yards in all directions, right? This isn't catch and get hit right away. There's going to be an opportunity for yards after catch here. And again, you can see he sets them up and gets another four yards, right? So he's gotten 10 yards on this play just by catching a simple hitch that was basically uncovered for us at, at the time. Again, we'll watch the tight just to see that the, the quarterback's eyes go ex exactly where we expect. And you can see he shortened his drop. Uh, we look for gun and three. For whatever reason, he went to the gun and one on that one. Okay, this may be the last clip. Uh, it's an interesting one. So uh, unfortunately, it was, uh, it's against Queens, and uh, we were down by four at this point. There was 52 seconds left in the game, and this is third and 10. Um, at this stage, we were two and one and ranked 10th in the country. Obviously, a win uh, against Queens would have, been, would have been great for that. As you can see, three on four to the boundary, three on three to the field, so we're attacking field. Okay, five on five to the box. We could run a huge draw, but not on second and, and uh, or third and 10. Um, so we're going to attack this three on three, and we're going to run smash again. Okay, so again, you can see in this case, uh, they are playing man, but you can see the corner is playing loose, and he's trying to give us some difficulty in reading. So it's really important that the number three doesn't break early, doesn't feel the win, and, and just try and get to the corner, and does everything that he can. Could the quarterback take this throw right now? Yes, he could. Uh, but again, we're trying to make the best decision possible off the corner. And even if we throw this out here right now, there's no guarantee we're going to get the first yard down, right? So we want to make sure that we force this corner to play deep third. Uh, as you can see, our two hitches at six yards are consistent. They're going to work back down their stem just for one. Here's the, here's the really important route here is the corner route. Okay, as you can see, he's worked his hard outside release here. He's now working get on getting back into his body. You can see we're already at uh, 12 yards, I'd say. Is that right? 40 would be. So we're actually at 15 yards right now. We still haven't broken to the corner. You can see we still haven't collapsed the cushion here. It looks like it could be, uh, you know, three hold, and other than obviously he's playing man with him. Uh, but this looks like a, a hold disposition. You can see now he's collapsed the cushion. And he is not aggressively attacking vertical. Because he knows if he does and we throw this hitch out here right now, he's stuck. Right? So even though he's trying to make this look like three hole to make us throw this hitch, rally down, and, and get off the field and win the game, we're also using our rules to put him in this bind. So you can see we've now given this two-way go to him by getting back on top of the, the, uh, um, the stem, restacking him. And now we can make our decision to go to the corner which is what we do because we've already attacked. And you can see at this stage, the ball is now gone. It's in the air. He is out of position. He's going to run and do everything he can to get back in the play, but he can't because he has been beaten over the top. He tried to show, he tried to give up the hitch, but he still had to honor. And if we had run this route at 12 yards or 14 yards or 18 yards that I've heard, we wouldn't have got this opportunity. But by running at the depth of the deep third defender, we've created this opportunity for us to go vertical. And this is where it just gets a little heartbreaking because at the end of the day, we still have to make plays. So we hit him in the numbers and obviously we dropped the ball uh, with 50 seconds to go. But I mean, the execution of this play was fantastic. Super proud of that receiver for putting himself in a position to make the play. Obviously, we always want our, our athletes to make the catch. Um, as you can see, the quarterback's eyes are immediately on the corner. We don't read down the free safety. We're not trying to look anybody off. We want solid decision making in every single thing that we do. It's really important and imperative to us. Okay. So we get out there. You can see now we've made the decision. We've thrown the ball. You can see we've, we have won. He did a, a wonderful job on his route. I mean, it was spectacular. He restacked. He got there. He's kept his route high. He's given the quarterback room. He's forced the defender to be out of position. Uh, we just have to put the catch in, right? So you can see it hit him right in the numbers. And obviously, we would have just fallen into the end zone and, and likely won the game. Um, 
and gone to three and one, but those are things that happen sometimes, right? But all we can do as coaches is prepare, pre prepare our, our players uh, for an opportunity to, uh, to make those plays. And we got to be proud of them when they put themselves in those positions. And, you know, listen, the next week he came out and caught a vertical corner for a touchdown. So, you know, obviously learning from your experiences and opportunities and, and getting better, uh, recognizing that, you know, not every play is going to win a championship, not every game you're going to win a championship in, but we're getting better week in and week out um, as we go. So that's, that's it for the presentation, guys. Hopefully you have some questions. Again, I'll put this uh, card up here before I stop the share and see if there are, there are any questions. Um, you can connect with me on Twitter, uh, Instagram. Uh, you can send me an email. Um, I can tell you that from other presentations I've done in the last uh, couple months, I've had lots of people reach out. I've set up individual Zoom calls with, with coaches across the country, Alberta. Uh, you know, talk about numerical advantage, happy to do it. Uh, you know, obviously, if you're interested in Smash, uh, any RPO game that we talk about, uh, be willing to share or anything. Uh, really grateful for, for the chance to speak to you guys today. Uh, had, a, had a lot of fun preparing for it and, uh, and doing this. So hopefully you guys have some questions and we can finish it off with that. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, Coach. Uh, thanks for your time, huh? Appreciate yeah, it. no, that was a lot of fun. Okay.